let's dive right into this because if I were to set up a card shop, it would probably look something like yours. And I think this is somewhat unique. Not only do you have this card store here, but you've got a warehouse with 20 million odd cards over there that we got oh, to 40 million. Four, excuse me, I, I, short, I shortchanged you, yeah. 40 million cards. Come on. What's, you seem to be focused on selling cheaper cards, especially what was back in that warehouse was a lot of cheaper cards. Tell me about the decision or kind of the decision making behind that, that this store has all different price points from 60 cents for the cards listed on the Beckett Marketplace on up to $2,000. Not every card shop actually surprisingly does that. So tell me about the focus on inexpensive, cheap cards, and why do you focus on those types of things? Well, I just try to focus on the hobby. Um, we talked about earlier that uh, silent majority mm -hmm. and the sheer amount of people that still collect cards. I mean, that was what built this business was having those affordable cards and being able to move through those cards and... Um, just satisfy customers. I think that there's a lot of people that look for cards out there that people just aren't doing the work and um, sell a tremendous amount of the cards. Um, it's always been a part of what we do. It's kind of the DNA of Burbank sports cards and it's kind of how we took quarter cards into dollar cards, dollars into threes, threes into tens, and that's kind of how we built the business. And to this day, we sell an unbelievable amount of sub $1 cards. What it, do you have an idea of what the average transaction is on on Burbank Sports Cards, either online or in your store? What it what it what is the average card price that goes out the door? It is about eight dollars on eBay because we sell so many expensive cards there as well. Um, so it's about eight dollars, but a lot of them we sell cards at a dollar sixty nine on eBay, mm -hmm. free shipping. Wow! And sell a tremendous amount of cards that way. And that's just the low point, but we sell a lot of 10, 12, 15, $20 cards. And are you using eBay standard envelope to, to send we out are. those cards? We are, it's been a real godsend and it's allowed us to be able to bake the shipping in. If we sell one card, we're not getting rich. We might make 20 cents on sure. it. It's, you know, the costs are excessive, but then again, it's customer acquisition, getting people into our ecosystem mm -hmm. and just showing them how fast we can turn those orders around. and. We sell a lot of them. I mean, people will buy 30, 40 cards at a time. It's just part of our business model. And about how many cards are you selling online per day? Somewhere around three or 4,000. Three or 4,000. And then how long does it take to ship out 3,000 orders? Is that all happening in one day? Does it happen over the course of a week? Usually things go out in like 36 hours. Um, it's not 3,000 orders. It's, you know, cards and it'd be 20 cards in an order but yeah it certainly keeps my team busy um we try to turn around as fast as we can um yeah a lot of times it's the same day it's just it just depends what the backup is but generally it's not that hard if i were to open something similar to this mm -hmm. and I, you have this huge warehouse in the back where you're housing all these cards what advice now that you've you've been doing this for a long time like you said, you, I think you started it when you were 12, 12 years old yeah. at this place when it was a coin shop. What advice now with taking in all that experience and somebody like me who maybe has maybe 50,000 cards or less, mm -hmm. what advice would you give to me to say, hey, this is how you should start to get to a point where I have 40 million cards? Yeah, I mean, everyone's got to start somewhere. I mean, 50,000 cards definitely makes a dent immediately. Um, the Beckett Marketplace, the Beckett Accelerator software would be the first thing I told you. Mm -hmm. um, I showed it to you. It's amazing. it's amazing. It's got 20 million different cards in the database. A lot of them have stock photos, all the nomenclature. You can use that software to push to eBay very effectively. I, that, was the, that would be the first thing I'd recommend. Um, building an infrastructure, getting the correct shelving mm -hmm. in place, creating a roadmap through your signage and making sure not only you can find cards quickly, but someone else can as well. Being organized, you know, using your numbers, letters, and colors like we showed you at the warehouse where you can find any card in a matter of seconds. There's efficiencies everything. But you can sell 50 cards to somebody for 40 bucks, but if it takes you an hour and a half to find them all, you now you're upside down and losing money. You know, get the right tools. That The scanner, I think, is critical in having that. And just be willing to do the work. Um, the free shipping model 
works if you want to move volume. You're not going to get rich with one card orders, but you know, build an organizational system and you just be willing to grind, be willing to go to the shows, be willing to, you know, dig through those dollar boxes knowing, you know, what you need. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's start with the Beckett marketplace. You're not going to sell a ton of cards on the marketplace itself, but the tool to get cards to eBay is tremendous. Every single one of those cards you saw at the warehouse is in their software. If their software did not exist, we would not be able to do what we do. Beckett, you know, will catch a lot of grief for different things, but their database, their tools for listing are, are best in class. And, um, you know, eBay, of course, is eBay. Um, you know, people can have their own websites and all that, but you're just, you know, you're a needle in the galaxy out there. You know, for the proper reach, you need eBay. You know, it's the fees are what they are. Um, selling singles is usually a decent margin for business, and um, the fees are just a part of doing business. When cards come into the door for, and somebody wants to sell you stuff, how are you able to determine the price you're going to pay for those cards? Especially if it's like a large lot. I see one or two cards, and you look them up on Card Ladder, look them up on eBay, sure. whatever it is. But I've got a big old stack of cards. Mm -hmm. How is your guy or you able to quickly determine a price for these cards and make an offer for those cards? We just pull a random number. Out you of just, the just <laughs> ten, cents, ten cents a card. You got a thousand cards, like a hundred bucks. You know, it just kind of depends. Um, our guys are pretty good at eyeballing stuff. If it's really generic inserts and generic parallels, it's not a lot of money. We can eyeball something and say that's fifty bucks. That's eighty bucks. Um, there's not a lot of effort put forth. Now you start talking autos, jerseys, serial number. Then it takes a little bit more time mm -hmm. to come up with numbers. Um, a lot of that stuff still sells for $0.99 cents to $3 on eBay. So we can generally put a bulk number. We'll pull out all the best stuff and go over and run comps and do all that kind of stuff. And people kind of understand. They just want to move the deal. They, yeah. they don't want to take it with them. Right. So we are able to you know, give you know, something decent as far as the store credit goes because that's all people generally want. When we make offers, the funny thing is we can offer cash. Let's just say it's 270. Someone walks in and Jordan's like, pay you 270 cash. But then we'll offer 300 in store credit. Mm -hmm. And honestly, I'm going to say 80% of the people take the store credit. 80% of the people take store credit yep. and stuff cash. Yep. Wow. So they're just turning that money and yeah. buying more cards. They want to buy the latest Topps baseball release. They see some cool slabs out there. Okay. And it's just fun walking around this store with the store credit. You know, it's like yeah. a kid in a candy a gift shop. Gift certificate, yeah. You know, and you're just going to turn those cards into other cards. You might as well get that extra 10% value. So, um, so that works well. It's kind of the circle of life with cards are okay. constantly coming in. How he, quick are, so I walk in with a thousand cards, you buy them. How quickly are those thousand cards now then put our, either on your shelf or in the back room uh, in, in storage? It, it depends. The better stuff, anything that's premium that he puts a post-it note on the actual card that we paid 12, we paid 200, whatever it happens to be, that stuff can generally go out within 24 hours wow. to our shelves. The bulky stuff will get broken down by sport. We'll look and see, ooh, there's all this 24 Bowman or something that's new. We'll hurry that next door, get it in the database, get it scanned. Okay. But then there's things that come in like 2018, Prism, whatever. That might be a while till we get to it, but the newest of products get priority. And any kind of graded card, they'll, they'll put... They'll be putting graded cards in my office all day. I'll be getting them bagged as soon as they get a break. Or at 6 o'clock, we stop by and they'll go ahead and start tagging those things. They'll hit the showcases tomorrow. Wow. And the way we sell cards, they could be gone end of day, that next day, or early the day after. Wow. So the turn rate is never been faster in here than we're doing it And right stuff now. doesn't sit around. You buy a 1,000 cards. It doesn't just sit in an office or sit in the back. No, you know, it gets for, dispersed to where it's going to go Very quickly. quickly. As quickly as I can do it, I, literally every right. card goes through me, but the systems are built so that my guys are always working on 22, 23, or 24 stuff next door. Right. And whether it's 23 Illusions football, we get a nice stack. It's something we don't see a lot of. Mm -hmm. It's hobby only. I get excited. I'm like, oh my God, let's get that over next door and make sure those get right. launched right away. There's other things that aren't nearly as high a priority. We already have plenty in stock. Those might take a little longer, but the newest of things, the things I have the least of, are the things that are the highest priority. One of my kind of earliest memories of you is, is going to the National, this would be like 2015, 2016, and watch, watching you kind of on the final day scoop up all this inventory at the National, and then there's all these, there's, there's some pictures of you floating around with what you bought at the National, and it's literally like pallets full of stuff. Yeah. How much 
of stuff you're buying for the store walks in the door and you're able to get it that way? Or how, what percentage of the stuff you're buying, you have to go to a show or you have to, uh, you know, venture out of the store to acquire this inventory? 95% of the stuff's in here. Walks in the door. The, um, we could go through 50 people in a day. You walk in, you know right away you're putting your name right on the piece of paper there. And then Jordan or Ray, they're going to call your name when it's your turn. And the amount of triple shoes they can buy in the course of a day is crazy. Um, at the Burbank Card Show, we had our three buyers there. You literally gave us your name and your phone number. We texted you when it was your turn, and we went through 90 people each wow. day. Um, but we don't travel as much as we should. Um, those days of buying pallets at the National, literally um, Sundays at the National were like Super Bowl Sunday mm -hmm. for me. And I would literally go around making offers on tables. And there was one table, it was actually a booth. And I made an offer on the entire booth. There was all kinds of people looking. I made the offer. The guy's like, okay, everybody, uh, whatever you pulled, you can check out here. No more cards. They, it was like Burbank just bought everything. And um, some people weren't happy, but that is what it is. But oh, well. um, but literally, we, would, we had two pallets five feet high um, that were just pure cards. And um, that was important. The problem now is when I go to the National, those same boxes, it's just repetitive mosaic, optic, prism. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, there's nothing interesting that doesn't already come in here. And you always want to be on the right side of the counter. Sure. You always want to be on the buying side. When you go right. to shows, now Ryan can spend a lot of money with all the premium stuff and things he buys. But as far as the bulky stuff, it doesn't make sense yeah. um, anymore. Plus, it's a lot of work to get it back. Sure. And um, we buy so much stuff here that, unbelievably, we can power all this just with what comes in over the counter. One thing I notice about this shop and that is different actually from a, a lot of card shops that, that, that have popped up in the last few years, you have a lot of unopened product, but there's no group break cabanas. I, I don't know, but I don't think you do group breaks. What's, what's the thought process there that you really haven't gotten into breaks? It doesn't seem like you really, you haven't mentioned Fanatics allocation one time to me in the last three hours. Yeah. Talk to me about that, that the, this shop seems to be focused more on the single cards, the cards they're able to get from, from people walking in, the 50 people that walk in every day to sell you stuff. What's, what's the decision making there that this, this store doesn't seem to be focused on unopened product? Well, we haven't, no question, but I've always considered to be successful in this business, you can only kind of count on what happens within your four walls. You can't be reliant on any other company, any other decision maker, somebody on a whim making a decision when that can negatively impact you. Mm -hmm. So um, basically I used to call it being Amazon proof where it would be tough for another company to come in and do what you do. Um, and now maybe it's fanatics proof or you know eBay proof, whatever it happens to be, being able to rely on a system that doesn't really need assistance from any other company out there. Now, don't get me wrong, we have a great relationship with fanatics and tops and they take great care of us, but product has never been our priority. And, you know, we stock a lot of it, we sell a lot of it, but we've always been a singles company, singles first. And um, Never a thought to do group break. I'm think, sure you thought about it, but... No, I actually never have. Um, you know, I always consider myself to be the tuba player in the marching band that just goes the other way. And um, group breaks, they have a purpose. Don't get me wrong, people enjoy it, they're entertaining, whatever. But if I had 100 people walk in the store and 85% of them had a negative experience, because let's face it, with group breaks, how many people really feel whole after a break is done with? 15%? Mm -hmm. How many actually get the cards that they actually wanted out of that product? Even a less amount? Mm -hmm. So if I smoked 85% of the people that walked in my door, <laughs> I'd be out of business. But it seems like with group breaks, that's pretty much the norm. Mm -hmm. And I've never understood it. And I'm not really big into fractionalizing things. Um, it doesn't really work for me. And it's not my model. It's not something that I believe should be the forward-facing part of the industry. Gambling, to me, it has its place, but it can't be front and center. And I, I think that it's a bad thing for the kids. Um, it's easy to get addicted okay. um, to these types of things at a young age. All of a sudden, a 14-year-old's going into breaks and you know, the mom's supporting it at first, but it's like, what do you have to show for this? You know? And it's like, yeah, that there's that rush. And I understand that. And I get that. And that sense of community and all that. But at the end of the day, what's in your hands mm -hmm. and what's it worth? 
So you're not stressed about the the, the amount of 2024 Bowman that you're able to get into the store. It doesn't that make does it, that doesn't make it's not going to make or business. break you. It doesn't make or break my business. It's nice that we get the allocation, but you know, if we didn't get any 24 Bowman, the place wouldn't look a whole lot different. Our business went a whole lot different. Um, I love that we get allocation, but if your business is only built on allocation and breaks, you're doing what everybody else does. I, I know you talk to, you know, the, the biggest people at Fanatics. What advice would you give to them to grow this hobby so that in 10 years from now, maybe you're selling 50,000 cards or maybe there's a, other similar shops and this is a very healthy, vibrant industry. What, what would you say to Fanatics? Speak to the kids, speak to the moms, get involved at the grassroots, get involved with Boy Scouts, get involved with Little League. Um, I think that we don't want to be the stamp business, which I was in decades ago where it literally aged out, interest died, shops went away, because um, that's happened with collectibles in the past, because there wasn't a generation behind to keep it up. Sure. So um, definitely the kids having the price points that are attractive to the kids. It can't just be, again, about bounties and Bowman Jumbos at $550 and all of that. I think in talking to Mike Mahan and talking to Michael Rubin, they understand that. Um, the great thing about Fanatics is that marketing muscle that they have. Most people actually saw Maddie, the girl in our shop that was looking at Devin Booker cards. Michael Rubin's in here for a while, sees Maddie looking at Devin Booker cards, pulls his phone out, gets Devin Booker on FaceTime, and Maddie just lost it. It was just, oh my God, she's got her favorite player right in front speaking to her. That's, great. That's the power of Fanatics. Let me bring you back, though, into the shop. Another, you know, I talked about how you don't seem that concerned with allocation, or it's not a main part of your business, unopened products, group breaking, you don't do any group breaks. A lot of these kind of newer shops, newer dealers, they're so focused on getting raw cards and then grading them right. and, and trying to flip them, buy, grade, and flip. I hear that all the time. Sure. That's the only way you can make money in this industry oh, yeah. is you buy, grade, and flip. I've been here for a few hours. I don't see big old stacks of cards going out to PSA or to TAG or to SGC or BGS or any of the 100 grading companies over the years. Is that not a part of... Uh, of it's a of part, but it's a small very part. Very small part. Most cards aren't worth grading. Um, the way the market is settled, um, the cost of grading, the way the market can shift within a three to four week period that the, your cards are out of your mm -hmm. possession. Um, certain cards you have to grade. You know, it's as simple as that. But the vast majority of what comes through, I always tell people it's like well over 99% of the cards that come over the counter don't get graded. Don't get graded. No. because You just sell them raw. Yeah, because... What, which cards do you send in? What's the very small percentage of cards do you send in to whoever? Um... You know, a lot of, you know, if a card is relatively clean and something we paid 50 or 60 bucks for, it's going to be looked at. And I look at a lot of cards and I'm like, unless it really looks like it makes sense, I'd rather sell it raw because I can sell it raw tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And if you keep selling it raw that next tomorrow and that next tomorrow, instead of waiting three weeks for that tomorrow where you don't even know what the cards are going to come back, it could be eight, nine, ten on any given whim. Um, I'd rather move the card, make a customer happy, take that money, buy something else. And by the time that three-week period goes by, that margin on that graded card is going to seem like nothing compared to that money that I've turned in that short time frame. Sure. Something that's popped up probably in the last couple of years that you know about it are these repackers and these people who do sell on, they do go on Fanatics Live or whatnot, and they sell either single cards or they sell break. I've heard of others. I, I, I know of a card shop that sells six figures of inventory a month to these repackers. Is that something Is that something you do? Do you have repackers either come into the store or contact you and want to buy a significant amount of inventory? Are those people, you know, buyers of your cards? Yeah, yeah. And, um, I mean, it's really staggering. 80% um, of the cards that we put into our system, the premium cards mm -hmm. that go through our sneak peek cases, our new arrivals, will generally sell within two days. Wow. Um, you know, we don't, the repackers don't get any special pricing. Mm -hmm. It's basically what happens is every card that comes through here gets its first shot in our showcases. Um, before it even goes online. Before it goes online. Okay. And we market that every single morning. 
These cases are brand new. These cards weren't out there. When I, when, when I opened the store this morning, those cards weren't there. We sure. add about 400 cards a morning into the cases, and they're exclusively there. Sure. But once we pull those cards the next day, because everything rotates daily, then all of a sudden the cards are going to eBay, they're going to BurbankCards.com, and we've got maybe three people um, that, yeah, that anymore that we send a list to of all that merchandise. And by the time that next morning rolls around, maybe 20% of the cards are left. A lot of people complain at shows that the uh, repackers are buying all the stuff. And I'm like, I don't see a problem with that. You don't have a problem. It doesn't make your job more difficult that you have these people willing to pay whatever it is, 80 to 90% for some of these high-end cards. More, I, we don't just, doesn't, it we, doesn't we, bother we, you at all. We, yeah, I mean, we wouldn't sell at those prices. Sure. And it's like, it's funny. We still buy as much cards as we've ever bought ever before. Bought. Because we buy everything. Mm -hmm. You know, we're not just trying to, if people are like, I'm paying 90% or whatever the hell it happens mm -hmm. to be. And I'm like, that's great. But you're buying a small fraction of what this guy has for sale. Right. So don't tell me you're paying 90% when you're only cherry picking. For they, these certain yeah, Exactly. Cards. And when you come in, we'll buy the whole damn thing. It takes a tremendous amount of cards to power what we do here with the way our showcases run mm -hmm. and the amount of stuff that we push online. And um, my guys are able to do it. But it, it's... I, it's, you know, I'm here to sell cards sure. and whether it's a repack or whether it's a retail customer, or whatever it happens to be, our job is to move those cards, take that money and sink it back in the industry and provide liquidity to who's walking in the door. It could be a lot worse. There could be nobody buying up these cards mm -hmm. and what the repackers, you know, for better or for worse, they're sopping up a lot of inventory that was out there that might have been stagnant in the industry and they're repurposing it in a way where all of a sudden the demand is bigger than the supply. And we haven't seen that in forever. Long time. And I think we're starting to see the market certainly starting to rise right. in a lot of um, ways. And it's just, we see how many cards that we're selling in 24 right. hours. And it's unprecedented. Right. Um, there's people that we're selling cards to that are we're doing more business with them than parts of our business that used to be the best parts of our business. And I'm like, that's absolutely wow. incredible. Wow. So our job is to make sure we have enough cards in the pipeline daily to support, to support this. it. But we have our key showcases that every single morning they are full with brand new cards. If you're not in that day, then all of a sudden those cards go into a system where chances are they're probably not going to be there the next day. And that's fine with me. Everybody knows Monday through Friday, Rob is putting 450, putting 500 brand new cards into those showcases um, and creating that FOMO through videos in the morning. Mm -hmm. If you're not here, you're I don't know out. what to tell you because those cards are gone and then, you know, we're going to get fresh stuff back in. But if you saw something in that video and you're not in that day, yeah, I don't know what to tell you. I think you, you mentioned that uh, maybe maybe you're looking at new locations or or, or something. What What's the future of Burbank there? Is, is it... Is it this location and the warehouse? Uh, are, are, are you thinking about a bigger building? Like, what's what's the thought process there? We're always thinking of what's next. Yeah. Um, the moment we moved into this building, there was always a thought, well, this building, you know, will tide us over for a while, but what's the next progression after that? Um, it's one of those things where I know what we can do. I know what we're capable of building with more space. I, I know that the experience that we can create for the consumer would be unprecedented. Um, are we looking at buildings? We're always looking at buildings. Um, have we looked one family like? Yeah, there's one we're actually interested in right now. Will we get it? Who knows? In LA, especially Burbank, prices are astronomical. <laughs> and the one we're looking at is you would have told me three years ago I was even considering I would have called you a mental case. Wow. I would have literally said you were absolutely out of your mind. Wow. And the fact is that we're very, very serious about it. Um, I just, we're maxed out here. I can't give a time frame, but I would be surprised that with the, if we didn't, within this year, uh, do something. Um, this year, you're thinking? I, I, it's, it's, it's. It's something I really want to get done. I think that that we need, I think we're ready for the next step. We're hoping that there's going to be some big splashy news with us, you know, in the coming months. Um, wow. So, um, yeah, yeah. That's, Fingers uh, crossed. We're, uh, we're, you know, 
I think that we've built something special, and I think there's people out there that actually value some of the things that we've done and want to work with us. So super pumped about that.